healing. And uh, I have a, an agenda for the month, and one of those things is uh, mental health and mental illness is something I, probably most of us, continue here to hear more and more about as something that um, people um, need healing with. Uh, but on Monday, did you hear it was Mental Health Awareness Week? Uh, so I, I redid my agenda because I thought, well, this will fit right in this week. So uh, I think Susan is here to read scripture for us. I'm gonna invite you to come forward. Um, of course, there's not really uh, biblical stories about specific mental illnesses. Obviously, medicine now is just a world apart from what medicine was like back then. But we do have story after story of Jesus healing people, not just in physical ailments, but ailments in their spirit as well. So this is one of those stories from the Gospel of Mark. Thank you. Good morning. morning. This is from the first chapter of Mark, verses 21 through 28. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly, there there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you done with us, Jesus of Nazareth? What have you... Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed. Then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He even commands unclean spirits and they obey him. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Gracious God, speak to your word into our hearts and lives that it might heal us and restore life abundantly. Speak through the words of my mouth and through the prayers of all of our hearts, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Have you seen this uh, TV commercial with Queen Latifah recently uh, for a healthcare something or other? I don't watch very many commercials. We probably don't watch TV commercials the way we did uh, many years ago. But she's in this new TV commercial and um, she's talking about stress and she's in traffic and she's uh, you know just talking about stress can have an effect not just on your mental well-being but on your physical well-being also. So you should get an annual exam and tell your doctor not just the physical things you're dealing with, but also the mental things, that there is a connection between body and spirit. I was like, Queen Latifah, that is some good theology. You go, right? Um, So that was was one of the first uh, things that I've seen in the public sphere, where people are really beginning to talk about this um, not just in hushed corners or in um, you know, really serious situations, but all of us, every day, all the time, every year when you go to your doctor. These are things you need to think about. You need to take care of your mental well-being. And then on Monday, um, you all probably know, I'm a little bit of a royal watcher, the, uh, you know, the monarchy in the UK, I truly believe every one of us is born and created equal and we all have an equal seat at the table. So I understand this is an inconsistency in my character that I really love to care about the royals who are high and mighty, but I just, that's the way I am, sorry. So I'm a royal watcher and uh, do you know who I'm talking about, right? Kate and and Will, all right. Um, So they put out this video because one of their causes is mental well-being and they're trying to um, destigmatize it so that we can all talk about it a little bit more. And uh, there were four of them, uh, Kate and Will, and then Harry, and then the American Duchess, Megan. She's in here too. Um, and I thought this video was really well done and brings up the, the issues. So I'd like us to watch this here. Everyone knows that feeling. When life gets on top of us. All over the country, 
Millions of us face challenges to our mental health. At all ages, at all intensities, and for all sorts of reasons. We feel stressed, low, anxious, or have trouble sleeping. Me, you, your brother, your mother, your friend, colleague, or your neighbor. Waiting. Wondering. Hoping. Hurting. We think there's nothing to be done. Nothing we can do about it. But that is so wrong. There are things we can do. From today, there's a new way to help turn things around. Every Mind Matters will show you simple ways to look after your mental health. It'll get you started with a free online plan designed to help you deal with stress, boost your mood, improve your sleep, and feel more in control. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. We're in this together. We can all benefit from taking simple steps to look after ourselves and help those around us. Because good mental health makes such a difference. Every mind matters. So let's do it. Find your way to better mental health. Search Every Mind Matters to get your personal plan. Come on. So obviously that's an advertisement, and you can, you can go to Every Mind Matters. I mean, it's a UK site, but the internet is the internet. And um, it's good. You can, uh, you can kind of fill out a real short survey, and they will give you some tips about how to just take care of your mental well-being. It also lets you know when things are beyond kind of the, the uh, average, and you might need to find some increased care. But some of the things I liked about that video uh, were that just first, the diversity of people that this is not something that just affects one person. This is a state of being human, is that sometimes we have those times, I love the way they put this, when life gets on top of us. Haven't you ever felt like that? When life is on top of you? And even the beginning of the video, it starts to get faster and faster and more um, anxious. Did you feel that? We've had those times, we've all had those times where it feels like it's coming faster and faster and where can you break free? Where can you find the release and the healing? And it says, um, you can. It does get better. I also like that it said, you're not alone. Now, hearing from a video, you are not alone, is, is not quite good enough. Uh, but it's a good start. That was kind of Mr. Rogers' principle, right? Mr. Rogers was talking through a television screen, but he knew if he told kids that people loved them the way they are, they would know that that is reality, that that can be true, and they would look for that in real life, in their lives, not just from someone on the TV screen. So that's true too. Um, when you hear someone say, you are not alone, it speaks reality to us, and we can then look for that from real people. I think that's one of the reasons we're here every Sunday, to remember we are not alone. So I thought there were some really good things in there to uh, prepare us to think about our own mental well-being and mental health. This is obviously a really big topic, and I am not an expert. Uh, I know people sometimes 
come to clergy for some counseling, but I, I really do not have the training for that. And so if people come to me for counseling, I can talk to them once or twice just to kind of help them see what's going on. But if there's a need for real counseling, there's professionals who know what they're doing, and that's not me. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. When we talk about mental illness and mental health, you know, I have as much to learn as anybody else. And so I might say things this morning that are wrong. I hope not, because I would hate to do that. But if, if I say something that doesn't ring true for you, let me know, and we can find the truth together. But we might want to just start with, like, what is mental health? Uh, that's such a broad category, and so many things fit there. Uh, as it talked about in the video, there's a mental well-being. Um, a lot of us try, and we know that we sometimes miss the mark, but we try to take care of our physical health, don't we? I mean, we're, we're a little bit conscious of what we eat. We try to eat fruits and vegetables, and maybe we go to the doctor once a year, or when we're feeling sick, we get our flu shot, right? Um, try to get enough sleep. You know, we try to take care of our physical bodies, but even the healthiest people still get the flu, or even really serious illnesses. So we can try to keep, uh, keep care of our mental well-being, too. And how do we do that? We try to find a good work-life balance uh, where we have meaningful work, but it doesn't take over us. We spend time with the people we love. We have a good support system that we nurture and care for. That makes life worth living, to have people to, to love and to receive love from. Um, we try to spend some quiet time, you know, not just be drained all the time, but have something we love to do. Um, and some of those things that are good for our physical uh, life are good for our mental life too. Going for a walk, getting some exercise, getting good sleep, eating fruits and vegetables, right? Taking care of ourselves. All of those things can provide a good baseline. But every once in a while, things can still get out of whack. I think the two uh, mental illnesses that I hear the most about, at any rate, just as a, a layperson, um, are anxiety and depression. You've heard people talk about these, and you've probably experienced them in some form in your life as well. Anxiety, worry, we can't get through life without worry. There are some situations we go through where the natural response is to, to worry about it. If you've got a medical test coming up, or your bank balance isn't shaking out the way you want it to, Worry is a natural response to that. But when anxiety becomes um, out of balance is when those worries start to become disproportionate to reality, right? Where the thing you're worried about might not even be real. Now, full disclosure, this is the thing I struggle with. This is, my, uh, this is my, one of my cross to bear, crosses to bear, um, particularly when it comes to my health. You know, I'm one where if I wake up in the morning and I have a, a neck ache, I think, oh my gosh, I, that must be the brain tumor. And I go all the way to the deep end of like, I'm dying, when really I probably just slept funny, right? But, and, and it sounds funny to talk about it, but there are moments I've had where I cannot get myself out of that headspace, where I really think that uh, my life is in imminent danger. And so that worry is disproportionate to reality. So sometimes I, I see counseling, I see a therapist, and I probably rely on my friends a lot <laughs> who calm me down. But anxiety is a real uh, condition. And then depression as well. Now we all, again, have times where, gosh, life just knocks us off our feet for a little bit. And we feel sad, and the things that we love to do don't interest us for a time. And you can feel depression for a number of reasons, both personal things and then communal things, things that you witness. But again, just like anxiety, depression can become um, clinical and become more serious. Uh, if you have feelings of worthlessness that persist for two weeks, uh, feelings of sadness or can't get out of bed or can't sleep, then you need to seek help or we, you need to rely on others around you to help you seek help because these things can be treated. They can be treated with medication, they can be treated with therapy and counseling, and they can be treated with a combination of both of those things. Now maybe all this sounds really obvious to you. Like, do we really need to talk about this? Um, it might be obvious to you, it might be things you've heard a hundred times before, and that's good, but I do think we need to say this out loud, particularly in the church. Because in the past, 
the church has not always been helpful to those with mental illness. I don't know why exactly, but there seems to be a little bit of a suspicion about treating mental illness with medication. And sometimes uh, religious leaders have, have said to people, well, if you just pray enough, God will take that burden from you. Maybe that comes from a good place, but that's not helpful. That's actually harmful. Prayer is certainly part of any life of healing, but if there is an illness in your brain, if there's chemical things happening in your brain, then medication can help that. You know, here in the church, we often lift up prayer concerns for those who have some kind of physical illness. And we would never say to someone who has cancer, well, if you just prayed hard enough, you shouldn't really need that chemo, right? We don't want to say the same thing about someone suffering from depression. I was, I was glad to hear this morning a prayer concern lifted for our soldiers who are returning, who are battling mental illness, because who knows what they have seen? They need help through that. They don't need to be uh, feeling ashamed of what they're struggling with. We should be able to, to pray for them. Right? So uh, one of the places that I've heard this, uh, heard discussion about anxiety and depression, is with our young people. You might remember two years ago, we were doing a sermon series about different stages of life. And so I got to go to Ridgefield High School for a morning and sit in on an English class with high school seniors. And I got to ask them, you know, what is it like to be a teenager? And one of the many things they said was that anxiety and depression are a real thing for them. And all of them, the teacher said, who, who, uh, who knows somebody who's fighting anxiety or depression? Every single one of them raised their hand. And I have to think that probably some of them in the room were fighting that as well. So this is a real thing. Uh, last spring in April, our school district hosted uh, a, an evening workshop about anxiety and teens. So I went down at the new school, and it was packed, friends. It was in their theater, and it was standing room only. People came early to get a seat. They kept coming the whole time, and they stayed an hour afterward to ask questions. This is a real need in the families in our community. And it was really eye-opening. It was a, a parent, Ridgefield School District parent, who's also a, a psychologist. He did a great talk. And he talked about a lot of things. And again, this is just introductory information. Okay, This was obviously not counseling. But he said, one of the areas, just one of the areas where kids pick up this anxiety is kind of from their parents. I mean, sorry to blame parents one more time, but uh, we do it from the best of places. It starts with good intentions. Because as parents, we want to keep our kids safe. That's one of our main jobs as parents, is to keep our children safe. And my goodness, isn't the world a frightening place? I mean, there is so much out there to be afraid of. Um, it used to be the evening news, and then it was 24-hour news that would tell you bad news, and now it's social media all the time, your phone just reminding you with news alerts of all the things you should be afraid of, everything from trafficking to, you know, the BPA in your water bottles, not safe for your kids to drink. I mean, so many things to worry about. And so what, what happens when parents are constantly trying to protect their kids from every danger. Don't do that, don't go there. You're climbing too high on those monkey bars. Get down, be careful. We're giving kids the, the, um, the picture that the world is dangerous and that every move could result in something um, awful. We're, we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts, but we're getting a little astray. So he said that uh, when kids get to high school, you know, if we have not checked ourselves, we can kind of give them this understanding that every action has a consequence that is incredibly important. So if you don't get a good grade on a test, that consequence will follow you. So he said there are kids who have anxiety about going to school because they're afraid that if they get a bad grade on a test, then they're gonna fail the class. And if they fail that class, then they won't graduate high school. Or if they do, then they won't get into a good college. And they'll let their family down and they won't make anything of themselves. And I mean, can you see how, if you thought that was gonna be the result of a test, well, I wouldn't wanna take that either. When we can look back and see, you know what? One test doesn't make a bit of difference. 
One test is just an evaluation of how you did on a couple of weeks in one class out of dozens that you're gonna take in your life. And you know what? Even if you do get a bad grade on that test, it's okay because you'll learn something. You'll learn something about what you need to know. You'll learn something about yourself. How can you bounce back? One of Union Ridge's three rules, they have three rules at Union Ridge. One of them is resilience. Respect, something or other, and resilience, right? We're trying to teach kids, you know what? Failure is a part of life, and you've got to be able to bounce back. Remember this um, admissions, uh, college admissions scandal recently where those celebrities got in trouble because they were cheating to get their kids into these really fancy schools. I mean, with the morality aside, what does that say to kids? You have to get into a good school. And if you don't, the consequences are, are unbearable. It would be better to cheat your way in than to not get into your top choice school. I mean, what is that saying to kids? We as adults, we know, look, if life doesn't work out in the way you planned, usually it works out even better. There's something there for you that you can find that will bring you joy. So we've, we've gotta be a little careful about what we're teaching the kids. I think the moral of that night was that kids, having, <laughs> kids have anxiety because parents have anxiety. Right? Uh, I've talked to some of the um, other moms I know around town who were there that night, and we've all said, oh my gosh, we learned so much from that. And we think about it on the playground when people are climbing up on top of the thing. Like, we wanna say, be careful, and then we realize, you know what, they'll be okay. Right? Kids have always climbed on the top of the playground from, and we'll be okay, we'll be okay. <clears throat> when we think about scripture and we want to find from our scripture, what does, what does God say about mental illness and mental health? You know, what does our scripture point us toward when it comes to our faith? You know, Jesus doesn't have one of these like anxiety seminars. You know, he doesn't have this, uh, hey, if you're dealing with depression, let me talk to you about that. Um, because medicine was so different then. The understanding of life was so different then. But we still do see over and over again stories about Jesus and throughout the whole Testament where God cares about the spirit of the people. And so we can deduce that God cares about our mental well-being. Jesus says, I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. And mental illness, strips away your ability to live a full and abundant life. So we have this story in the Gospel of Mark. And by the way, this is in the first chapter. This is one of the very first things that Jesus does. He is baptized, he calls together his disciples, and then this is his first act. This is the first thing he does. That's important. So uh, he's in the synagogue and he's teaching. And the people are amazed because he's teaching in a different way than they've ever heard of before. He's teaching with authority. That's the only way they can describe it. It's like he knows. He knows. And uh, here comes a man who is shouting. Now I would assume that the people know who this man is. They're a small community. They've probably experienced him before. And here he comes shouting, I know who you are. You're the Holy One. And Jesus addresses him. He quiets that evil spirit that's within the man and says, leave. And the spirit does. And then the people are amazed. They are amazed. This man, this man from who knows where has brought healing to one in their community who has been ill for so long. And they're saying to themselves, who is this person who can even cast out, get rid of those unclean spirits? Now I'll say uh, at the front that this is, this is not a perfect parallel here, all right? Those struggling with mental illness don't often come in and uh, shout in groups of people. Some do, but most do not. And I'm even um, a little iffy with calling this an evil spirit because from uh, the people I've talked to who have wrestled with mental illness, sometimes they have learned these beautiful things about themselves and about life by overcoming and working through their anxiety or depression or whatever it is they have to work through. You know how sometimes you've, 
you've had a loved one who has suffered some kind of physical setback and they end up saying something like, you know, that heart attack was really the best thing that could have happened to me, right? Um, so sometimes those things that we think are setbacks actually lead us to a, a path that we really are grateful for. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to just throw around that evil word so easily. But at the very least, we can say that this man is, is wrestling with some kind of spirit that has taken away his ability to live a full and abundant life. And that's what mental illness does for us. It takes away our ability to live that full and fulfilling life. So what can we learn from this story? First, Jesus can heal the person struggling with mental illness. He takes it seriously. You know, he treats them like anyone who comes to him with any ailment, whether they're bleeding or kids got, boy, they just remembered their stories, didn't they? The people who couldn't walk, the people who couldn't see. Jesus treats him just the same. He doesn't say, oh, you're just trying to get attention or snap out of it, right? Jesus doesn't say those things. We should not say those things either. So that's the first thing. Jesus cares about this man's spirit. The second thing is, it can be healed. That evil spirit, that, that spirit that's weighing that man down, it can be healed. He can know new life without it. That's such an important message. We have to remember what you're going through now is not forever. It's just for a season. The particularly cruel thing about some of these mental illnesses is that they tell you lies. They tell you lies that you think it is forever. It's who you are and it's your whole life. And we, the community, have to tell people it's not. It's not your whole life. It's not who you are. It will get better. Healing is for you. Um, the third thing is that it takes the whole community. The whole community is part of that healing process. Just like that video that we watched, you are not alone. This is not something that we, we have to go through by ourselves. And it's not something that just affects us by ourselves. It affects the whole community. So it takes all of us to check in with each other, to be the ones who reach out and to say, you're not alone, and I'll be here with you, and it will get better. So uh, we are all needed. And the community around that man was amazed, and they could, began to see what they could be with the healing of Jesus. So friends, this is part of the world that we live in. Maybe it wasn't part of the world that you grew up in, or maybe it sounds new to you, but this is where we are now. We do a good job at praying for those who have physical ailments. When you have a physical ailment, it's, it's hard to hide that, usually. Those who have mental ailments, <clears throat> it can be harder to see. And so we need to know and we need to share that Jesus cares about those with mental illness, that God cares about our spirit. So thanks be to God for good doctors and good medication, for counselors and therapists, for good friends and fresh air, and for every new day, the grace to start again. Because healing is possible. Thanks be to God. Amen.